Okay, so the aeronauts again, just a reminder, we just talked about this, but the aeronauts, the definition in our book are basically were the pilots of, of lighter than air aircraft, balloons and zeppelins and such. So sailors in the air, aeronauts. As I mentioned, there's a movie out right now uh, called The Aeronauts, talking about a scientist who's trying to prove his theories on weather and uses an aeronaut to take him up and try to break altitude records and things of that nature. So we've been talking a little bit about zeppelins and such. Let's talk a little bit more about the Civil War. Let's back up just a little bit there. Okay, so when the Civil War began, again, we're back to hot air balloons. And this is where uh, Count von Zeppelin got his idea for launching his dirigibles a little bit later on. He saw hot air balloons in action during the Civil War. He was over here as an observer for the German military. And some aeronauts, people that own balloons, uh, wanted to bring them to use them in the service of the military for air or reconnaissance. And one of these folks was Thaddeus Lowe. And he's Dr. Thaddeus Lowe. And he has, uh, you know, been a, working with balloons for about 20 years, and he wants to try to use his balloons to help the help the North during the Civil War. So he comes to see General Winfield Scott, who is the head of the Union Army, and talk about the balloons. He gets a meeting with General Scott, but General Scott is uh, not interested. He sees no military need for these, and again, he's got a war to plan for. It's at the beginning of the war, and he doesn't really have any interest in the balloons. But Dr. Lowe. He has a friend that is the head of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., who happens to be a friend of Abraham Lincoln. So he, his friend, sets up a kind of a demonstration for President Lincoln where Thaddeus Lowe will take up his balloon about a mile away from the Capitol and be able to tell Abraham Lincoln what he could see from the air, passing telegraph messages down to him. But President Lincoln uh, sees the value in this, saying this might be a great way to keep an eye on Confederate forces. A matter of fact, during the war, when they do use the balloons, they kind of use the campfires they can see out in the distance to estimate the troop strength, to get an idea of uh, what the how large a force the enemy has and such. So, you know, this is the beginnings of air reconnaissance in the military. This is the first time from the air in, in the history of the world that uh, we have air reconnaissance and they're using the hot air balloons. Of course, they're filled by hydrogen at this time. So President Lincoln sends uh, General Scott a message tells him he wants him to relook at these balloons. Of course, we think about this, the general, who does he work for? He works for the commander in chief, the president of the United States. So he, he's, he has to take another meeting with uh, Dr. Lowe and, and strongly consider the balloons. So the balloons are put to work for the Northern Army during the Civil War. So, anyway, so um, he's the first commander, if you will, of the balloon corps in the military. That's Dr. Thaddeus Lowe. But it was a struggle for him because, again, uh, the, the generals didn't see a lot of value in it. So they didn't put a lot of money towards it, a lot of staff to it. Sometimes status low over a couple of years had to pay for himself, you know, take money out of his own pocket to pay for supplies and stuff. They didn't want to help him get the balloons to the battlefield. And they had a few successes, but they had some problems, too, of course, because of lack of support. When they asked for permission to get the balloon forward and stuff, they didn't want to give them the wagons to bring them and things of that nature. So Thaddeus Lowe came up with a way to, to bring the hydrogen to the battlefield in these cylinders and inflate the balloons and send them up. Of course, one time the balloons got torn on some trees. Another time got wrapped in some, uh, ripped or torn on some telegraph wires. And of course, again, the generals uh, didn't see the value, but it did make it up and make some key contributions just for a couple of battles. But as the money dried up and they quit sending them staffing and money, uh, Dr. Lowe got kind of uh, aggravated with having to pay for things himself and they disbanded the balloon corps in 1983. So the balloons, if you wanted to say were balloons successful in the Civil War, the answer would be no. In the North, I just told you the story where you know they tried to use them. Dr. Lowe brought them forward, but they weren't really supported. And if you don't have the support, it's hard to be successful. The South tried a couple of balloons as well. You know, there's a legend that the ladies of the South donated their silk dresses and a balloon was put together. But one story has a balloon being floated up the river to the battlefield and the balloon gets away and the southern soldiers had to shoot their own balloon down so it wouldn't be captured or taken by the northerners and used against them. So, again, for the Civil War, uh, if you had to say were balloons successful or not, you would say not successful. OK, but it was breaking ground, you know, like a milestone again, the first time air reconnaissance. Dr. Thaddeus Lowe 
I read a little bit more about him. And he was doing balloons, you know, several years before the war. He was he would love to try a transatlantic uh, balloon flight, which people thought was crazy to get blown up in the, the jet stream. But he was working on things, and he was an inventor and a scientist. And uh, matter of fact, he was testing his balloon for distance flight right when the Civil War had begun, just a few weeks into the Civil War. And he took off from Cincinnati, trying to go east, and it kind of the winds took him south, and he was captured as a spy in South Carolina. He convinced them that he was a man of science and not really associated with the Union Army at the time, and they released him and let him go on. Again, during the war, the balloons weren't supported as well as he thought they should be and uh, just couldn't get the staff and the money, so they disbanded it. After the war, you know, he did some more work with hydrogen cylinders and such, and he became a millionaire. He uh, came up with a way to, uh, I guess, another system, the thing that he had put together was ice-making machines back, and this is, you know, 1860, 1870, things of that nature. And he moved to California and Los Angeles and had ice making plants and became a millionaire. But later on, he got wrapped up in a railroad scheme and uh, he lost his money and he lived out a healthy life till he's 80 years old living with his daughter. But uh, that's the story of Dr. Thaddeus Lowe, you know, an inventor, a scientist, really, the, you know, the father of air reconnaissance because, you know, he believed in what these balloons could do. Now, the next time we talk about balloons in military history is the Battle of San Juan Hill. We're about 30 years past the Civil War, and now we're at war with uh, the Spain, with the Spanish-American War in about 1898. This picture you see on the, on the right here is Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, who were the big heroes that came out of the Battle of San Juan Hill, and they're going to survive the battle and become heroes. Maybe hot air balloons will play a part in that, which again, in the future, another let's say 20, 25 years, Teddy Roosevelt's going to help the Wright brothers because he knows the value of being able to see the battlefield from the sky. Let's talk a little bit about the Battle of San Juan Hill. Again, the Army now uh, had a balloon section in the Signal Corps. The Signal Corps is communication, and from the balloon, they would pass information down uh, from the battlefield. And what they were doing a little later on was they, when they had the rope tethered down, they would write these messages have a ring attached to the paper and slide it down the tethered rope and the people could read what they were seeing from the sky. But again, at this time, the, the American military only had one balloon, only had one in storage. And when the war breaks out, one of the battles that occurs again is the Battle of San Juan Hill in Cuba, which was a Spanish territory only 90 miles away from America. So I gave them a chance to see what the balloon could do. They ordered it up, the commander to bring the balloon down and let's try this thing out. Okay, so the, uh, the commander in charge uh, said, you know, this, this balloon could spy, but it had to be as close as possible to the enemy to see what was going on there. Okay, so the first time the balloon went up, well, they brought it down and it hadn't been used and it was in kind of bad shape. Pieces were stuck together. Some pieces had disintegrated, but they were able. They only had one man who had ever been up in a balloon over there. And he kind of took charge and got some other guys together. And they worked and worked and worked and they were able to inflate the balloon. And the first time they took it up, uh, they, they weren't close enough to the battlefield. They couldn't see enough. So the commander ordered them forward, get a little closer. Now, the guys wasn't in, we'll be in rifle range. Commander said, I understand that, but we need information and need you to go up and get that thing done. So when they went up this time, they went up several times, but they, they got up and uh, from this closer position, they could see a new trail that would lead to the Spanish forces there. So they could see the battlefield and what was going on, where the Spanish were. And they, they said um, the Americans were bottlenecked on one little trails of the battlefield. and You could flank them on another trail, a key piece of information. So the U.S. commanders divided their soldiers into you know, two groups and sent them against the enemy, which was a strategic uh, advantage in the battle. OK, they also suge suggested from the air the balloons did uh, to better hit their targets that they were aiming for in artillery. They said, you're hitting the wrong places. We can see from the air where the artillery, American artillery bombs are hitting. Move them left, move them right, you know, how many degrees or or they could even say uh, just adjust it, you know, uh, 200 yards west, this kind of thing. And they were able to direct the artillery against the trenches that the uh, Spanish had dug in and some of the artillery uh, devices that the Spanish had. So they were able to direct artillery from the sky to make it more effective. And historians say 
that uh, these actions, the information from the balloon, really two real critical pieces, one being a way to kind of move the forces better, finding a new trail, a new path to the battlefield, so you could split up and kind of you know take the Spanish from two different sides. And the second one, of course, being able to direct the artillery more effectively by seeing where it's hitting and having and adjusting it from the air, telling them how to make adjustments to it. So they say it led to victory in this battle. Okay, and again, Teddy Roosevelt becomes a, a national hero as with his Rough Riders, a volunteer group that he brought forward. And you could say maybe he might have died that day if they didn't have this information to be more uh, have make more effective decisions at the Battle of San Juan Hill. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little about heavier than air flight. Okay, at the same time these balloons and zeppelins are showing success and being seen around the world, we had people working on the designs, <clears throat> kind of following the footsteps of Leonardo da Vinci with heavier than air flight. We're talking about you know, gliders and planes and things of that nature. And one of the first people we want to talk about is Sir, Sir George Cayley. He was nine years old when the Montgolfier brothers made their historic flight. And he died just in like 1857, just before the Civil War, when hot air balloons were used in combat. But again, he was working on the glider concept. And he was a scientist and a researcher and an important uh, person in aviation history, you know, an inventor as well. These are some of his diagrams on the right here. You can see the years 1804 to 1852, working on these devices that would uh, be able to fly using, again, more of the glider concept. And he talked about the idea of fixed wings, right? Having the, like we think of today, you know, fixed wings with the, you can see in the photographs you know, or the drawings to the right there, the wings, the glider we might build today in the classroom just to throw around that kind of thing or what airplanes look like today. And he also had the idea once you have the glider working, <clears throat> you could add a motor to give you that thrust to keep you up in the air. Again, he wrote a research paper that was very important in aviation history. And he talked about how to provide lift using wind resistance, going against the wind, like when you put your arm out the window and you're doing like this when you're driving down the road, wind resistance going there, and he could give you some lift that way. He talked about that, and he talked about uh, drag and thrust, you know, the principles of aircraft today. You know, lift, drag, and thrust are the three main things, and he, he's the first one to really discuss these things. And again, this uh, gentleman, I don't think he ever flew specifically, but he did uh, a couple flights. A 10-year-old kid one time, he got him to fly up for a real short flight in a small glider, and that's you know, documented in history. And also he had a driver who uh, he sent got the, and a bigger glider, got to fly as well. And of course, the guy's story is he was kind of a little bit upset. You know, he came there to drive, ended up flying in a glider, thought he could have been hurt or injured or whatever the case may be. But, you know, these were the first times people were trying to get up in these gliders. So uh, Sir George Cayley, again, an important aviation scientist and inventor. The next person we'll talk about in aviation history, who was uh, maybe the father, some call him the father of modern aviation, was a German, Otto Lilienthal. And you can see his picture over here to the right where he is actually flying his own gliders. And again, he's at the same time frame uh, as the Wright brothers almost, he ends up dying in a crash right before 1900 when the Wright brothers were beginning their research and such. So this gentleman, uh, Lilenthal, made over 2,000 glider flights. So he was testing designs and he was very successful. People saw him flying in Europe, kind of a, uh, you know, I guess a celebrity, if you will, coming through there. He built 18 different types of gliders, doing a lot of research. He had 15 of them were monoplanes, just the one wing. And of course, you see over here in the picture, that was a biplane design with one wing on the bottom and one wing on the top there, kind of what the Wright brothers are going to model theirs after. So again, very successful. You know, he was moving along and he had plans of putting a motor potentially in one of his gliders, but he died in 1896 in a crash. And I highlight that in yellow just to kind of emphasize, you know, how close he was to the Wright brothers because the Wright brothers began in 1900 really doing their research. And in 1903, they made the historic flight. So he died just before them. And of course, you know, they could read his research and stuff and some of his designs to kind of, you know, help the Wright brothers a little bit. But on this, on this fateful day, he had gusty winds when he took off and uh, it stalled and he crashed. And I think it may have broke his back and uh, he died. Right. So again, in yellow, the Wright brothers, 1903. So just six years apart. 
So again, this was a very influential aviation, I guess you would say, designer, researcher, the father of modern aviation, Lilienthal, all right, with his gliders. Now we're going to move to somebody who was competing directly with the Wright brothers, Dr. Samuel Langley. The same time frame, the Wright brothers weren't the only ones trying to achieve the first flight. Others were as well. So Dr. Samuel Langley was the first American really to try to build one with a motor. The Wright brothers we'll talk about later, but at this time they were working on their, um, they started with gliders and stuff, then they want to add the motor. So Dr. Samuel Langley was that first American. And he got the government, you know, excited about his project. You know, he was a he was a known scientist, and he, he was the head of the Smithsonian Institute at one time. So they gave him a grant of fifty thousand dollars, you know, free money to do his research. And today's dollars, that's like a million bucks to try to help him uh, do his research to be able to put that first plane up in the air. So in 1903, two months before the Wright brothers' first flight, and the government was really knew nothing what the Wright brothers were doing at the time, but uh, there was a lot of hoopla. Everybody was excited because the government had put this money forward. Newspapers were out there, and he attempted, Dr. Samuel Langley, attempted, he attempted to uh, launch his plane from like a catapult system. He put a barge in the river and was going to launch it off the catapult, catch air, the engine would be on, and it would take on from there. And, of course, uh, it was a, a big spectacle, a lot of newspaper coverage there, congressmen and stuff like this, because they put the money forward. But it was not successful. He had two attempts, and it hung up like the aircraft on his catapult, and it just fell in the river. You know, twice they, he tried, and it was unsuccessful. So the American Congress and, and military people there watching, they kind of lost faith in this, and uh, they weren't as excited about aviation. And so, you know, it's not going to work, not going to work. Again, people, in, and particularly in France, they were just uh, loving aviation and this kind of thing. And that's going to set the stage for the Wright brothers and how they had to work on their aircraft and try to, how they had difficulty uh, selling it to the military and to the government at first. So if we review this whole lesson, we began, uh, you know, the scientific principle with these lighter than air aircraft. We're talking about hot air balloons and zeppelins as buoyancy. The gas or air inside the balloon is lighter than the air that surrounds it in the atmosphere, whether it be hot air, right, because hot air rises, hydrogen, 14 times lighter than our, uh, than our atmosphere, or later on helium. That's buoyancy. That's going to give you that float, that lifting power. And, of course, the ones that uh, really get credit, the most credit for the hot air balloons are the Montgolfier brothers, from France. You know, they started thinking that from the fireplace, watching the smoke rise up the chimney. Why is that smoke rise? You know, it's a smoke. It's a mysterious power of smoke. And they started working with that, grabbing that smoke, making, uh, when they built their fires, it was making them as smoky as possible because they thought it was the smoke that was giving them lifting power. And they designed balloons and, of course, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And in 1783, uh, sent the first hot air balloon up with the humans in, on riding in the balloon, okay? And about the same time frame, uh, others were saying, you know, we could put hydrogen in those balloons and make them fly even further because they had read about hydrogen from articles and books and publications due to the printing press. And the third bullet there, the uh, dirigibles, of course, we think of them as blimps today. That's what we would call them, blimps, maybe a zeppelin, but a rigid airship, you know, a steerable, a steerable airship at a, like a motor and a rudder to give it some forward push and to get that done. Count von Zeppelin, you skip on past printing press there, and he did just that. He was an observer in the Civil War, saw hot air balloons, got excited, came back, improved on the design, and worked on a dirigible, had the first airline, if you want, you know, commercial airline where people wanted to ride on them. And his uh, Zeppelins could go maybe at their peak 65 miles an hour. So, you know, a huge improvement coming through there. With, uh, with the Zeppelins flying in the air. And of course, the famous end of the real people wanting to fly them as far as air travel kind of thing would be, uh, you know, the Hindenburg crash when it burned up and it was on the news covered and everybody saw it. And the coverage is kind of so dramatic, people kind of were afraid to fly any longer. Today, you know, we see what we would call blimps and they're really for marketing and things that nature, a Goodyear blimp things like that coming through, just a, a marketing, uh, I guess you'd say, um, 
I guess, a tactic, if you will, you know, to draw some attention to your organization by having a, a big, a big blimp. Okay. And of course, the people that fly an, a, an airship, we're talking about a blimp or Zeppelin or hot air balloon, the right term for them is an aeronaut. You know, later on, when you get in the airplanes, be a pilot. But for the lighter than air aircraft, balloons, Zeppelins, things of that nature, it's an aeronaut. We talked in this lesson about the Civil War and how balloons were used, but they weren't successful. On the northern side, they had a better chance, but the generals really didn't buy into it. And uh, the leader, Dr. Thaddeus Lowe of the Balloon Corps, got disgruntled, got, you know, because it was a struggle. He had to spend most of his own money and things like that to keep the balloons operating. So he just kind of gave it up in 1863. And uh, so the balloons were used by the north and the south. And uh, you know, they proved they could do air reconnaissance, but not supported as well in the north. And the south just didn't have the resources to put towards them. So not real successful, but it was a, you know, it was a breakthrough. And then 30 years later in the Battle of San Juan Hill, the balloon that they used there is credited with maybe uh, the victory because it had two pieces of information that it shared with the commanders on the ground from the sky, you know, it directed, there's another pathway to get to the battlefield. We can kind of surround or uh, take the Spanish from two different sides. It also was able to direct the artillery to be more effective. Now it was, as it got closer to the battle to be able to see better, it was shot full of holes and uh, nobody, none of the men were hurt, but the balloon was damaged, couldn't fly anymore. Of course they said, can we get another balloon? We only had the one. And this war, of, uh, again, the Spanish-American War, was only it lasted a month or two. Then we talked about some of the people that were working on heavier-than-air flight. We're talking about gliders and airplanes. Sir George Cayley, right, a scientist who's researching gliders, kind of taking Da Vinci's designs a little bit further, built some gliders, designed some gliders. Supposedly a 10-year-old boy went on a short flight in one of his gliders, and then his driver, a coachman, went on a flight. And of course, he was, you know, in the same time period, he was nine when the Montgolfier brothers flew. And then, of course, he died right in uh, right before the Civil War began. And they used the balloons in the Civil War. OK, and, and Otto Lilienthal, same time period. You know, he's caught in the latter part of the 1800s, but he made over 2000 successful uh, glider flights. So he was recording. He was, you know, he was like a celebrity in Europe, very successful. But then he dies in a tragic uh, crash in like 1896. Now we're almost to the period, you know, the Wright brother, that's six years before. And Dr. Samuel Langley is the first American to really research this. And he's given money by the government to do his research and build a plane. Now he started with a motor and then built a plane around it. And he, again, he's competing against the Wright brothers. Uh, the, you know, he may know who the Wright brothers are. The government doesn't know. But, you know, he had multiple people around the world trying to achieve this thing. And he gets his plane built. He tries to launch it off a catapult in the Potomac River, but he's unsuccessful. 